is Data Local Temp. Data Local Temp is presenting enhancing vulnerability research through the use of virtual reality workspaces. This talk will provide an overview of Data Local Temp's setup for performing vulnerability research within virtual reality and some of the benefits he has observed. Data Local Temp is an independent security researcher focused on mobile technology. Recently, he has, a, has enhanced a lot of his work by using visual, visualizations and virtual reality. Boy, that's hard to say. In particular, visualizing code coverage in Android and then navigating the functional function graphs in virtual reality. So please welcome to the stage, Data Local Temp. Take it away, Data. All right, thanks for having me. Uh, this is my first time presenting in uh, at any DEF CON, let alone in VR. Um, so let me get my notes here, and hopefully everyone can see uh, everything I'm presenting. I <clears throat> All right, I'm already getting heckled from my friends. So uh, let's see here. So first of all, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Data Local TMP or Data Local Temp. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about virtual workspaces and how they've helped me enhance uh, the security research that I do. Uh, before I get into that, though, I wanted to take a moment just to thank uh, DCG VR. Uh, they've been really welcoming and helpful, uh, putting everyone together and streaming this. So thank you for that, and uh, thank you to everyone here for uh, attending. Uh, I've posted the link to this slide deck in the chat. So if you're interested in any of the links that I show in my talk, feel free to browse to that. It'll also be on my Twitter, which uh, you're welcome to go to and, uh, and uh, go from there. So today I'm talking about security research in virtual workspaces. But before I do that, I'll just introduce myself. Who am I? I'm a security researcher that primarily focuses on mobile platforms. Previously, I was focused on privacy issues within mobile applications. Uh, I was featured in TechCrunch for some work that I did on shining light on apps that screenshotted personal information. And I've worked with various bug bounty programs such as Bird Scooters, the Biden campaign app, uh, Ring Cameras, Match.com. But nowadays, I primarily focus on the mobile platform security with a recent eye towards uh, native reverse engineering. But the thing that I'm very similar to all of you is I am a virtual reality enthusiast. And I just want to check the Discord to make sure that everyone can hear me fine. And it seems like you can, so that's good. So the content of my talk today, and I believe you'll be able to see on the right-hand side a, a visualization of one of my workspaces here. Apologies for the GIF uh, quality, but uh, this is an example of a workspace that I would use. So you see my virtual keyboard, you see my monitors, they have a terminal and my note-taking application. Uh, I'm going to be walking through some of the benefits I've found uh, with these virtual workstations. So, uh, first off, what I want to convince you of is that security research as a whole is known as, is something called deep work. Uh, it's a bit of a corporate jargon term, but uh, deep work, I want to convince you that that's what security research is. And then you can trust me that we'll get away from this like corporate jargon and move into actual technical spaces later, but uh, I think it's valuable. Uh, and then what I want to talk about is how virtual workspaces are really great for enabling deep work. And then I'll talk about my personal setup. So the types of software and hardware I use to enable this. And then I'll go through a couple of like technical examples. Uh, in particular, I'll be talking about uh, debugging a binary using LLDB and Voltron. So JBO talked about LLDB earlier. It's uh, very similar to GDB. And if you use GDB and Jeff, you'll know that uh, LLDB has something called Voltron, which is very similar to Jeff for GDB. Then I'll also be talking about some reverse engineering tasks that I find are really benefited from these virtual workstations. So we'll be talking about Ghidra and Dragon Dance. 
And then I'll finish off by talking about uh, future virtual reality environments and things that I'm excited for uh, seeing there. One thing I'll say is there's a lot of photos of my cats and, uh, and cat pictures in this slide deck. So feel free to uh, use the cat emoji whenever you see one. And we'll continue from there. So like I said, I want to start off just trying to convince you that security research is something called deep work. And I want to introduce the concept. It's a term that's been coined by Cal Newport. And he has a fantastic blog introducing the concept uh, which is available in my slide deck here. But really, deep work means that this is the cognitively demanding activities that we do that leverage our unique skills, like our unique technical skills, to generate rare or valuable results. So that's Cal's uh, definition. But for me, really, it's any of the work that I do that leverages my elite skills to find bugs. So anything that... Uh, produces uh, the results that are valuable to you. And I would, I would say that most of the work that you do that produces like a CVE or a proof of concept is likely deep work. And while it does sound like corporate jargon, I do think that it will resonate with many of you that uh, deep work is the state that you find yourself in when uh, you're producing your most meaningful security is it research. Is me or is the audio out again? Oh, just checking. Can everyone hear me? Nope, I'm good. Can you make sure you have megaphone on? Is is that better? Oh, yes. <laughs> Sorry, I, I wasn't aware I had to have megaphone. How far back uh, do I need to go? You, you were audible leading up to it. Oh, I yeah. was? OK. Yeah. OK. It wasn't loud. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Sorry, guys. Um, my apologies. So yeah. Essentially, with this slide, I'm just trying to convince you that the majority of the work that we do uh, regarding security research, when we're doing the very meaningful portion, it's generally very focused and it's in a state that uh, is associated with something called deep work. So if you want to get into this state, Cal on his blog really says, this is what you got to do. You have to prepare. So prepare your workstation and your environment. Uh, enabling you a focus. Uh, really, this time only needs to be one to three hours. It doesn't need to be a really long period of time. You should go into it with a very clear goal. So setting a dedicated goal for yourself. You should stretch. So don't like try and touch your toes. What you should be trying to do is define like a logical chunk of work for yourself and then go beyond that chunk towards the same goal and then track. So track how much deep work you're doing because that'll help you improve the amount uh, you're able to do day on day and that'll help you improve in general. But that's kind of the end of the corporate jargon speak because now I'm going to get into what an example of deep work might look like for me or anyone else in this room. So for example, if I wanted to get into deep work, I would clearly state the goal that I want. So for example, I need to understand a vulnerability in a structure that is passed to a function. So there's a function, there's a struct being passed to it, and uh, someone online says, hey, in my write-up, I show that uh, this struct has a vulnerability in it somewhere. So a concrete chunk of work could be something like defining the data type for that structure. So going into Ghidra and starting to define out all of that. So preparation could be uh, preparing your workstation environment, putting on your headphones, listening to the music you like, opening Ghidra, setting up GDB, uh, setting the breakpoints that you're uh, about to analyze and just reverse engineering. And then stretching from there could be something like, once I define a data type, I'd like to understand all of the accesses to the member within a struct. So we have like a very clear chunk of work that we want to do, and then a very clear method of like going beyond that chunk. So of course, that's all great in 
in theory, but in practice, a lot of us, I would think, get distracted while we're in this state. So distractions really kill your ability to focus and context switching in particular uh, destroys that focus. So for example, in a lot of my work, uh, which could involve like tracking variables across decompiled functions or comprehending complex security write-ups, uh, I find them very analogous to a wall of yarn, which when I context switch, be it for any distraction in my home, um, I come back to that wall of yarn and half of it's missing. And I think that'll likely resonate with many of you because we're all doing the security research that's very focused, but any sort of distraction can uh, destroy some of that. And because of this destruction of focus, often I would find myself caught in the shallow end while focusing on a very deep problem, something that requires a lot of attention. And so instead of doing the like harder aspects of that work, I would find the easier aspects that maybe feel productive, but aren't uh, requiring my skills. And I would do that instead. So, oh, okay, I should plan a time to read that right up or, oh, well, I have my social media accounts. I should probably produce some content for that. that that's not really work that requires any sort of uh, uh, technical skill, perhaps. It's work that feels easy and, or that is easy and feels productive, but isn't really achieving your goal of deep work and immersing yourself in the deep end. Uh, and of course, because I have an audience here, I have to include some photos of my distractions at home. So I have my workstation here with my lovely 1980s uh, wood paneling, as well as my bizarre photo of a cat family. And then I have my two cats here uh, who are consistent distractions for myself while I'm working at home. So and there was no way I was putting a picture of my partner here or anyone in my family, because I'm sure they would not be uh, keen to hear that they're a distraction. <laughs> um, so how do I avoid these distractions and embrace deep work? And uh, I would say virtual workspaces is how I get there. So virtual workspaces are really great for uh, enabling deep work. Uh, I find that they're extremely configurable. Uh, they really provide a workspace that can change to match the task at hand. They're also extremely portable, only re really requiring a VR headset in addition to a laptop to provide like a very consistent and familiar environment. And they're extremely immersive. Um, they can essentially disconnect you completely from the outside world. And I'm just going to quickly expand on each of those points. So. For configuration, you know, this isn't the first time that someone's thought, hey, maybe I'll create a workspace for when I'm getting into deep work. Uh, this person here has put aside a tent in their yard where that's where they go when they need to focus completely. So uh, it's not a new concept that you create a specific workspace for you for deep work. Um, but the really nice thing about virtual workspaces is it's very configurable. Um, you can create any number of virtual monitors in any configure you like. So if you want to resize monitors, if you want to monitor the size of a movie screen, that's available to you. Uh, there's also a lot of really mature tools for creating your own environment. And something I haven't seen yet in VR, but I'm excited to see is custom tools for security research because I think all of us are very used to working in a non-interactive, non-VR security research environment. But with the maturity of Unity and headsets and the popularity, I think we'll get there at some point. And uh, if you do end up making a security research tool that is for VR specifically, I'd love to see it. The other part that I love about VR or uh, virtual workspaces, workspaces is the portable aspect to it. Uh, when comparing a virtual workstation to something in your home, it's a lot more portable. All you really need is a VR headset in order to gain the benefits uh, as well as your laptop. And you don't really need any additional controllers these days with how 
um, how strong the hand tracking is. At this time, you don't need those. Another very uh, popular thing or very uh, ideal thing about virtual workspaces is they always provide a very consistent and familiar environment. So if you're very used to working in your home, uh, if you travel, for example, and you're in a hotel, you're in a completely new work environment, things aren't where you like them to be, and perhaps you're working off of a small laptop screen, it's not ideal. But the other thing is, is like, it does require that you tether or connect over the LAN. So there are still like connection requirements. And finally, the nice thing that I like is immersion. Uh, I really can't stress enough how immersed you can get into a virtual works space. Uh, they completely disconnect you if you have like a pair of quality noise canceling headphones. And a really pro tip would be to try and match your environments like soundscape to the environment that you're in in virtual reality. Uh, that'll just enhance your immersion. I haven't invested in any smellscape candles. Uh, I would like to know if there's like a smellscape that I could get, but uh, just tricking the first two senses is enough for me to be fully immersed. And then if you do need to be reachable while doing deep work in a virtual workspace, it's best to set up a messaging application on your computer. Uh, I can attest that it's fairly frightening if someone physically interacts with you while you're in this state of immersion. So uh, especially if you're living with someone else, just have them send you a message on the computer before they, uh, before they like wake you out of immersion. Uh, yeah, so that's the three main things I really like about my virtual workspace. But now we'll get into what that actually looks like. And I'll share some of the environments, um, specifically some of the environments that I capture on my phone while I'm on, like wh whenever I'm traveling. So I'll take a 360 photo. I think it's a really nice way of capturing the environment that you find relaxing and then bringing that back home with you. So like, for example, this is a 360 photograph with my monitors that I've imported into my virtual workstation. Another one of uh, the streets of Korea. So this would be like, you just scan the environment with your phone and then you can load that in to your virtual workstation later. And then more Korea uh, pictures. And then if you're a real weirdo, what you can do is 3D scan your, your own office and load that in so that anywhere you go, you'll be within your own office space, um, which is kind of interesting. And there's that bizarre photo of a uh, cat family again. So uh, yeah, this is what I have for my virtual workspace. And uh, now I'll talk about my personal setup. So for my personal setup, uh, it's really everything you see in the photo uh, there, plus a set of noise canceling headphones. So I use a Quest 2, a MacBook, and a set of headphones. And they're, it's really nice, MacBook, and uh, it, because you get virtual monitors out of the box. Uh, if you have your laptop and you don't want just one screen to visualize everything, you can spin up virtual monitors at a moment's notice. I have tried using Ubuntu and Linux, uh, but it's lacking in the virtual monitor uh, features. Though you can use XR and R to fake out some virtual monitors, it, it does become a bit difficult. Windows has, a, Windows has a very similar support level to Mac OS. So if you're a Windows person, it'll work for you out of the box. And then for software, I use an application called Immersed. Immersed is what does all the virtual monitoring, uh, virtual monitor rendering, as well as the Android debug bridge, so ADB. Uh, what I really like about uh, the Quest 2 is it is an Android device. So ADB provides like a bunch of features um, such as tethering, which will allow me to reduce the latency uh, between my like inputs and what's rendered in the, in the headset. 
And then it also provides a modern Android environment. So I believe it's running like Android uh, 12. So I can ADB shell in there and run Android commands on my face, which is a bit funny, but uh, it's true. And then it also provides like speedy file transfers. And now I'm using Frame VR for presenting. So thanks for having me. And uh, I'm excited to use Frame. All right, so now that we've talked about uh, why I like virtual workstations and uh, what benefits I think they have, I'm going to talk about uh, virtual workstations in practice. So I've compiled two examples which illustrate real situations I found myself in that benefited from a virtual workspace. And in these examples, I was traveling, I only had my laptop and headset, and so I'm really comparing working from my laptop uh, with working with my laptop from a VR workspace. Uh, these examples are all documented in my blog. So if you see any of these examples and you're like, oh, I want to learn more about that, uh, you can go to my blog and uh, find them there. So the first one we're going to be stepping through is debugging with LLDB and Voltron. And then we will be stepping through reverse engineering with Ghidra and the Ghidra extension called Dragon Dance. Finally, uh, because I like mobile security and the Quest 2 is an Android device, uh, the specific binaries that we're going to be uh, debugging as well as software reverse engineering will be a native library from the Quest 2. So this native library that we'll be looking at is libosutils. It was developed by Meta, and I pulled it off my Quest 2. And then I'll be specifically looking at an exported function called getProcessName. It's fairly uh, obvious what that function does. It takes a PID, and it returns a string of the function name. Unfortunately, at the time I was looking at this, it kept crashing. So it was perfect for us to look at it in LLDB. So let's get started with the debugging example. Oh, and if you want to build the program that harnesses this binary, it's on my blog as well. Cool. So the example, debugging with LLDB and Voltron. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with GDB, Jeff, if you're familiar with Jeff, which is the GDB enhanced features extension, it's quite comparable to Voltron which provides enhanced features for LLDB. Foundry Zero, if you follow them, have just created something called HLEF, I think. I think that's how they want it pr pronounced, not LEF. Uh, and uh, I have a comparison of the two tools, Voltron and LEF, uh, and it's documented on my blog there. So if you're wondering why I'm looking at LLDB for Android, it's because Android NDK support has recently shifted. Um, they're no longer packaging GDB server, and now they're packaging LLDB server. Uh, it's also documented in their using debuggers documentation that they are moving away from GDB. But that's all an aside, really. What is the problem here? We have a binary from the Quest 2 that when we run it, it crashes. We don't know why it's crashing. So the solution that many of you would think of doing is attaching a debugger and starting your analysis. And generally, what that would look like on a laptop is something like this. So on a laptop, you would have a single screen here, and you would have um, your interpreter attached, or sorry, your debugger attached. And at the top, you might have the LLDB interpreter followed by perhaps a visualization of the stack. And then below that, you might have the registers on the left and the disassembly of the binary on the right. And at the very bottom, perhaps a backtrace. At this point, uh, I think it's fairly obvious to those who are watching but the terminal is at its max for conveying information. You could maybe slip another pane in the top right or in the bottom, bottom right as well, but uh, at the moment, the terminal is maxed out for conveying information, and it'd be hard to visualize much more. So uh, that's when 
you go, okay, I want to be able to take notes. I want to be able to visualize memory. I want to see a lot more than what I'm able to get now. So that's when you can switch to a virtual workspace, which looks a bit more like this. So in a virtual workspace, we get to configure our monitors any, any way we'd like. We can be in a cafe and be getting the same experience that you see right here. And what you're seeing is we have our LLDB interpreter in the middle, uh, just as we had in the last screen, where we're visualizing the registers in the stack. And at the bottom, we're visualizing the backtrace. On the right-hand uh, monitor, we have, uh, oh, that's where we have the stack. In the middle is where we have the disassembly, apologies. And at the bottom, we have uh, two hex dumps of memory regions that we're interested in. So we've increased the amount of information we're able to consume like probably by triple just by switching to a virtual workspace. And then we gain the benefit as well of being able to take notes on that far left monitor, um, which I think is extremely valuable not having to switch windows on a laptop, for example, because I find that that switch can often be very similar to context switching or being distracted. You know, you switch monitors and you pass over your Discord, or you switch windows, you pass over your Discord, and now you're engaging in a conversation, and uh, it's not ideal. So uh, that's an example of what debugging in a virtual workspace would look like. Next, I'm going to give an overview of what reverse engineering in a virtual workspace would look like. So um, using, and in particular, this example, I think really benefits from the visualization piece because uh, I'll explain what Dragon Dance is in a moment, but it provides a very nice visualization of execution. So, First, I have to admit my intuition on why things crash could be better. And I would often find myself uh, setting breakpoints in LLDB without really understanding the binaries execution. Um, so I have an LLDB session, but I don't know where to place my breakpoints or really how to approach the analysis. Often what this meant is I would open my decompiler of choice, which is Ghidra, and begin to reverse engineer. But I'm here today to tell you that there is a better way. And that better way is to use a tool called Frida. I'm sure many of you have heard of Frida. And then also use a tool called Lighthouse, which can, can, which can generate code coverage maps. So what I mean by that is it can generate a map of all of the code which was actually executed in a binary not just show you everything. It'll really highlight what was executed in that binary. And then what you can do is take that coverage map and load that into Ghidra in order to visualize the execution of your binary. So that's where if you're using a laptop, like we are in this uh, example of a workspace, you know, you have your highlighted blocks of code so in that middle pane for listing, in your middle listing pane, you have the disassembled code. And please note that you don't need to be able to read this. I just want you to be able to see uh, the illustration of it. But in the middle pane on Ghidra, you can see the highlighted portions of assembly code, the ARM64 assembly code that has actually been executed. And as we browse through it, we can like kind of jump to different places of the function graph. But the function graph is very small. We're not able to see very much of it at once. Um, in the Ghidra pane, we can see a bit of the decompiled code, but not all of it at once. And there's a lot of stuff missing. Like we can't see our symbol table and uh, we can't see our Ghidra data types. And that's a lot of information that we're missing just because we're working off a laptop. So in a virtual workspace, it would look more like this, you know, we're back in Korea again, and we have our function graph on the far left, our notes being taken uh, as often as we want without having to switch contexts. And in the middle, we have our beautiful listing pane, our decompiled code, and all the information on symbols and data types that we could ever want. So 
this is a huge improvement for myself when I'm out and about and I want to be able to visualize a lot of information at once. And this is what's possible today using free software. Um, so really that's what I want to say about debugging and reverse engineering. Uh, now I want to talk about some of the futures of VR workspaces and what I'm excited for. A lot of you are probably thinking I'm about to say the Apple VR headset or the Quest 3 or, or, or any of these new headsets. And, and while I am excited about those, first of all, the Apple headset is like 3000 USD and the Canadian dollar isn't doing that great. But uh, I'm more excited about the work that independent developers are doing to produce new tools. So Unity, like I said before, is available to build your own workspaces and it can be custom built to suit your needs. Uh, and it doesn't just need to be something that is more monitors, right? Like what I'm showing you today and what's available right now is kind of just giving you more monitors, but not really taking advantage of the uh, 3D uh, reality of VR, right? So I'm excited to see what developers start coming up with specifically for security research. But I have to admit that there is a large learning curve and I haven't gotten to the point where I could produce any meaningful security research tools in VR. But I can take a stab at trying to produce my own workspace in VR. And so I spent some time in Unity and uh, the development took a lot of work and uh, a lot of free assets and all of this. And it sort of resulted in something like this, where we get our LLDB sessions, our, <laughs> our uh, Ghidra extension, our weird cat image up, up top there, and all the browser we could need to stream music. We have AFL, we have our memory dumps. Um, yeah, so it's nice that you can go out and produce your own tools in VR without being um, beholden to any sort of like third party. And with that, uh, I think I'm fairly under time, but uh, I just have a few parting thoughts to leave you with. So I found VR workspaces to be a really nice escape when work from home became the norm. It was the nice way of like changing my environment and getting outside while being inside. And of course, this isn't for everyone. It does take a while to get used to and I would recommend uh, like playing some games to understand how long your eyes can handle it and hone your uh, virtual reality legs as it were. Also, uh, just know that you can't really have as unlimited amount of monitors. It does become computationally intensive. And I'm really pitching it to you because you're the folks that are attending a conference in VR. And, uh, and that's why I think you'll, you'll resonate with this. And finally, I just wanna leave you with uh, security research. You know, it is that deep work and just keep in mind that deep work doesn't need to be very long. It just needs to be meaningful. And I think these virtual workspaces really lend themselves to doing meaningful work in a deep work state. So with that, I'll leave it there. Uh, are there any questions? Actually, yes, I had a few. Um, how it looks like looking at the screens that they're it seems very like tiny type on the screens, even in VR. So yeah. is there a way to zoom to the screens or anything like that? Yes. Yeah, yeah, there are for sure. Uh, the I, I forgot to mention at the beginning, but uh, my visualizations are going to be almost unreadable. Everything's been squeezed in, but in the environment itself, everything's quite legible. And uh, it's kind of funny... There was an article on Hack a Day, I believe, maybe even yesterday, where someone says, there's no way that VR headsets will ever replace monitors. And I, I don't know about it, to be honest, because I found it to be quite uh, legible. But someone's talking about like the actual rendering of pixels. And I don't know, it seems quite intense. But uh, yeah, it's quite legible, I find. 
Uh, also, how do you use your keyboard? I mean, you have to be a touch typist, I assume. Uh, you can look down if you're very, very careful. Actually, what's uh, mm -hmm. nice is uh, I, I didn't mention it in my talk, but I've purchased a keyboard that is uh, meant to be paired with my headset. And when I look down at my fingers, it will do a pass through and show me my actual fingers on the keyboard. Yeah, uh, you can use touch sense with that yeah. and do it with the, the keyboard so on cool. the thingy. Yeah. It's uh, not very fast, but I'm sure you can program something in there to make it faster. <laughs> and then Touch Purple sense. Pony, you asked, what are the things you need to get started at a minimum? Uh, if you're okay with just having a single screen, like an Ubuntu laptop and um, maybe a Quest 2 would be the cheapest for you right now because the Quest 3 is coming out. Like if you want to go on the cheap, I would say a laptop and a Quest 2 bought off of like Craigslist because the Quest 3 is coming out. The only question I had, um, yeah. I was asking the question, but I did what I did last night to x-ray there where I was talking and the microphone wasn't on. So <clears throat> anywho, my question yeah. was, is how do you keep the pressure off your face? See, mm. that I have a problem with. I love my VR headset. I love playing with it, yeah. tinkering with it in VR space because it's private. You yeah. know, people can't see my screens, but the problem is yeah. that thing leans on the front of your face so hard that there's no way to take the pressure off your sinuses and your nose right I, there. And yeah, you so it off and you're just like, damn it. Yeah, I would I would say take a look at the uh, strap you're using and maybe you can change that and try and make sure that the pressure is sitting on like the crown of your head rather than your face. Because what I'll do is um, what I'll do is I'll adjust the strap so that I can really feel it like just resting on the top of my head and then only tighten it so that it creates a, a proper seal with my face, if that makes sense. And, and I was going to say, uh, when, when you're doing this, uh, your virtual desktop, are you using um, like the, 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 the app like virtual desktop or is it that v no, spiral I'm using, uh, no i'm using immersed if you've immersed? Got, oh yeah, yeah. i've played with that yeah and, and it's nice because you can change your uh environments to 360 photographs which i have a pixel phone and it'll let me take those so uh you can just use adb go into the immersed uh data directories and modify the 360 environments you're in um I'm just going to answer CyberThoth's uh, question here. How long can you work continuously? What I was trying to convey in this presentation is deep work and like the work that you do that produces like the valuable results. I, I find like I benefit from only one to maybe three hours. Uh, so generally working continuously is only about at max, I would say four hours. And I also do use my headset for, in this situation, for like DMing Dungeons and Dragons. And that goes for about four hours as well. So uh, there's multiple use cases for this. I just find security research really benefits from it. Well, this was one of the things I was trying to use my headset for. And it turned out my laptop didn't have a graphics card for the uh, mm -hmm. PC desktop. So yeah. to know that there's a way to do it without having to have that function is amazing. I I'm really excited to try this. Yeah, please let me know how it goes for you too. And if you ever have any problems, you can uh, send me a message. So. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Well, thank you guys. Uh, last side, thanks so much. And uh, hope everyone has a fantastic day. Thank you so much.